You know, we should be crawling, jumping, sprinting, running, you know, carrying, lifting, pushing and pulling. It's all these movement patterns that, if you think about most gym programming, you might pick up one or two or three of those. And then you had a bit of splits, you know, stretching at the end. Or I'll have leg day, buy and try day, um, you know, I'll have a strength day, I'll have an endurance day. Mm -hmm. It's like, actually... Mix it all in. Mix all. it all up, mm -hmm. yeah? Keep your body confused. And there are all these health benefits that come from movement, which again, a lot of us are ignorant of. But even if you're, you're not aware of the science of movement or sports science, we're aware that we feel better. You know, uh, once we start moving, we get the endorphin rush, we feel, we feel great. Once we move, it's usually just getting... <laughs> doing it. Doing it, which is, is, can be the problem. But there's something that happens to our physiology when we move, uh, because it's part of our survival. If we didn't move millennia ago, we would die. Hey friends, it's Mike Mutzel with High Intensity Health. Thanks for being here, thanks for showing up. I'm super excited to be with Daryl Edwards here, right outside of the, t tell us where we are. I'm on a bomber <laughs> screwed up, Daryl. <laughs> yeah, we're in Green Park, which is in central London. Um, we have a typical London day, cloudy, beginning of May. Um, and this park used to belong to the royal family. It, mm -hmm. it may still do, Okay. it may still do. So uh, it's just great to be outside. It's awesome. Regardless, regardless it is, of the weather. It's brilliant. And we're going to talk about fitness, primal fitness, and primal play, the, the title of your book. But we want to talk about shoes and movement. And I think that's really important uh, because I think it sets the stage for your work, your life's work. And that's you kind of using the lens of evolutionary biology to make day to day decisions in your life. And, and starting with proprioception in the feet. Let's talk about shoes and, and that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wearing shoes. These are uh, by Vivo Barefoot, but you know, um, pretty much any minimalist shoe that you buy mm -hmm. has a few qualities. So they have a really wide toe box, um, minimal support. And uh, so, you know, that's what yeah. happens. And you pretty much can sense, get a lot of feedback from the ground. So many people that aren't aware that there are more nerve endings in the feet than in the hands. And mm -hmm. um, the main communication channel for movement and proprioception is, is via the feet. And oftentimes, we're just not aware of that kind of natural relationship with the earth um, and we rely purely on what we can see. Mm -hmm. um, but if we had better awareness of what our feet were doing in terms of contact with the ground, then you're less likely to be injured. You're less likely to take steps or running steps that are likely to cause damage. Mm -hmm. um, you're less likely to twist an ankle or, or twist a knee or to have soft tissue damage in the knee. So one of the things that, that have improved for me by going minimalist and by going barefoot even, even better is you know you start building up some of the muscle in the feet that should have been there in the absence of wearing shoes for the majority of your life you know imagine if you're wearing gloves mm -hmm. pretty much since uh, as a toddler yeah and you wore them for your entire life and then you started you took your gloves off and you had to actually manipulate an object um, very weak and yeah you'd be yeah. very weak you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't have as much control kind of fine motor control of, of your fingers mm -hmm. um, your ability to detect, um, you know, pressure and temperature, and you know, um, the control of an object would be wouldn't be as as effective. Sure. So that's the, the similar principle for for the feet. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about us as a species, we're not very adept when it comes to specialising in movements. So, for example, we can't jump as good as a kangaroo as well as a kangaroo. You know, we're not as fast as a cheetah. <laughs> you know, uh, we can't climb as well as monkeys, but we can, we can perform all of those movement patterns as generalists. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes us remarkable when it comes to movement, is that we, we can change from one movement pattern to the next, and we can be very conversant in those movement patterns. That's right. And yeah, it's something that we, again, it's something that we, we has been lost because we focus on, oh, okay, I'm a runner, I'm good at running. That's what I'm going to focus on. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a strong guy. I'm just going to do lots of strength training. And it's like, well, what about all the other stuff mm -hmm. that we should be doing for healthful, nutritious movement? Yeah, like so, some of the ballistic movements, jumping or lateral type movements are, are lost if you're just doing north south. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you're just working in the sagittal plane all the time, um, you know, and you're not working in the transverse plane, you're not working in the frontal plane, you know, it, it's, we are three dimensional creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, so our movements should be multi plane. They should be multi-directional. 
uh, there should be a, a different intensities. And of course, we should be able to work in steady state. We should be able to run and walk long distances, mm -hmm. but not uh, at the expense of powerful, short term movements. So I should be able to sprint as well as run and mm -hmm. walk. I should be able to jump great distances. Yeah. Um, I should be able to climb um, without thinking, oh, I don't have the upper body strength because I'm only focusing on my oh. legs for running, say. Sure. Um, so once you realize that it's, you are better off being almost like a decathlete, you know what I mean? Or even, I don't know, whatever the, um, the term would be for kind of a multi 80 different, yeah, 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 yeah. If there were 80 different events that we, we should be specializing in terms of movement, that's what we should be, that's the sort of athlete we should be. Mm -hmm. you know, we should be crawling, jumping, sprinting, running, you know, um, carrying, lifting, pushing and pulling. It's all these movement patterns that, if you think about most gym programming, you might pick up one or two or three of those, you know, yeah. and then you had a bit of sp you know, stretching at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, or I, I'll have leg day, buy and try day, um, you know, I'll have a strength day, I'll have an endurance day. Mm -hmm. It's like, actually... Mix it all in. Mix all it all up, mm -hmm. yeah? Keep your body confused. Yeah. Uh, keep your body healthful and, and exuberant and full of vitality. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I think is really important when, we, when we're looking at, at fitness. Yeah. Uh, and so Paleo Fitness, uh, which is my first book, talks about um, how important it is to be in touch with your ancestry, be in touch with your biology, um, and to think about movement, not just for fitness, but also for function and for longevity. And there are all these health benefits that come from movement, which again, a lot of us are ignorant of. Yeah. But even if you're, you're not aware of the science of movement or sports science, we're aware that we feel better. Mm -hmm. you know? um, once we start moving, we get the endorphin rush, we feel, we feel great. Once we move, it's usually just getting... <laughs> doing it. <laughs> doing it, which is, is, can be the problem. But once we have done it, we usually feel great about it. So mm -hmm. there's something that happens to our physiology when we move, uh, because it's part of our survival. If we didn't move millennia ago, we would die. You can, I mean, yeah, we there's no eat. Uber Eats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you'd have yeah. to go get it. There's no fridge that you could just walk a few meters to to get your food, mm -hmm. um, or an internet, you know, a click button on the on a mouse to order your deliver, get your food delivered. It was like I need to go out and graft yeah. and hunt for my food, and I may not even be successful <laughs> post hunt. Do you so know you'd what have mean? to fast <laughs> for a period of time. Yeah, yeah. You'd, have, you'd have to fast. You'd mm -hmm. have to you'd have to struggle and strive. You'd have to sometimes you'd have to be a scavenger. I mean that you know. That, eat that's, bugs and things. Yeah, yeah you'd, you'd eat whatever. You know, you, I, I watched a documentary once on a on a hunt by the Hao San, and they they literally were tracking a cheetah um, because they were aware the cheetah was about to go for a kill, kill the gazelle, and the cheetah would only eat what it would need to, mm -hmm. and it would bury the animal um, and then come back and refeed. So the hunters actually waited for the kill, and once the cheetah was a few hundred meters away, they actually went into to capture some of that, some of that meat, and they're like constantly thinking, let's Is make the sure. Coming back? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the cheetah would kind of bury it to come back for a rainy day, but possibly just hey? come back and refeed. Ah, so uh -huh. you know, it wouldn't just gorge for the sake of it. It would like mm. eat what it would have, what it would need, mm. and it would just come back and, and refeed. Wow. So I mean, even for a cheetah, they're not always successful. Mm -hmm. They can run for sixty-five miles an hour for like four seconds. Um, so they can catch the slowest gazelle, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they have to be spending a lot of time tracking the animal, moving very slowly because they know that as soon as they accelerate and sprint, they're going to burn out within a few seconds. Mm -hmm. They so, have one shot. To, yeah, that's yeah. it. One shot and then they're, that's it. They may not mm -hmm. be able to sprint again for the rest of the day. I mean, they're completely, completely fatigued. So, so um, you know, there's, a, there's that kind of symbiosis of you know, why you can see gazelles, a, a cheetah can see gazelles a few hundred meters away mm -hmm. and decide, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry at the moment. Yeah. So you, you guys are fine. Don't worry about it. They can graze that, you know, and then as soon as they hear that, like, oh, oh did you hear that? Did you hear, what was that? What was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're uh, like, yeah, yeah, stop feeding guys. We, get, we need yeah. to run because the cheetah is on its way. Yeah, so, <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so humans, you know, learn how to track mm -hmm. uh, animals and aware of when cheats are hunting and, and sometimes they will scavenge. 
yeah. you know, as, a, as an alternative to, to hunting or, and, and gathering food. A lot so. of things come to mind there. Um, and actually, so I was watching a friend of mine, Sarah Kinnan, she's, a, she's been on the podcast as well. She's in Vancouver, BC. We were mm. watching a bald eagle get a fish and then crows were constantly circling the bald eagle to get the scraps. You know, so this is common within in the food chain. But what comes to mind with that is, is there's so much food waste. I, I think I was reading mm. yesterday in your, uh, in your post in the Times about how billions of pounds every year, just in the UK, of food is wasted. So we're so picky. And the article was to encourage people to, to buy that funny looking carrot or the zucchini that's slightly misshaped yeah. so that we're not having farmers waste all this food because we get so picky. Whereas like yes. we're evolutionarily evolved and our, our ancestors like ate dead animals that were previously eaten, but we don't like the carrot that has two little, what that look like legs, you know? So yeah. we got to yeah. get over that as a culture, I think. I think you're right. And when, when I was a kid, I mean, that was commonplace to mm. see vegetables looking like that. They weren't, they weren't all perfect. Yeah. And now we're driven by a kind of a supermarket culture where everything has to be perfect and, and anything else is discarded. That's all you see. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you expect. But if you're if you're a gardener yourself, yeah, I am. Yeah, you know? there's nothing's perfect. It yeah, has dirt nothing. on it. It looks and we love it. It tastes a lot better, right? It does for sure. Yeah. It's far more nutritious. Um, and I think it was France actually recently, maybe about a year or so ago. They, uh, I'm not sure if it was it was law became law, but the supermarkets there have aisles of misshaped, you know, fruit and vegetables um, that are now being purchased. And mm. It's like this is very healthy food and why are you abandoning what nature has provided you know mm -hmm. so um, and if you go to you know natural organic food stores here or, or farmers markets you will also see that sort of produce yeah. so what the supermarkets say no no that doesn't pass our quality assurance yeah. test yeah. Um, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, to buy. Yeah, 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 it's brilliant. I know we got a little off topic there, but mm. so let's go back. Practical tips for people. If, if they are not yet ready to commit to the shoes, the very minimalistic shoes, can they do barefoot walking or barefoot hiking? If so, how much per day would you recommend? Well, I'd say at, at the very least, make sure when you go home, you know, discard the slippers, discard the comfortable shoes that you'd wear at home mm -hmm. and be as barefoot as much as possible at home. Um, if you have a garden, you know, if you don't want to go out into, the, into your local park or walk on concrete and barefoot, just go into your back garden and, and to become aware of, of the textures and to, and to feel how good it feels to have your feet in contact with the earth. Yeah. Um, you know, when you go on holiday, if you go to a beach holiday, Kick them how off. many people? Yeah, how many people? You know, it feels great getting your feet in the sand and having that kind of natural exfoliation. And mm -hmm. so, I think just just get used to the sensory, extra sensory perception of of what it feels like to have your feet exposed and, and in nature. Then you can start thinking about the conditioning um, and what type of of exercises that your feet should perform in order to before you start thinking about running and training barefoot. So for mm -hmm. myself, I started walking, you know, a mile, a couple of miles barefoot in minimalist shoes then I started you know very slow running um, then I got to training and, and, and to sprinting but it took a while to condition it's not only your feet it's you know your Achilles heel it's your you know it's your calves it's it's, it's your body your posture changes mm -hmm. um, as it becomes more aware of how it should be moving now you know. question don't want to interrupt you but is that yeah. because you're walking differently like how primal walking, like basically have shoes screwed up our ability to walk pr pr appropriately. Because I noticed that yeah. too, is you're not putting so much on the heel because it kind of hurts, right? And so you're, you're using your whole foot almost to grip the ground. I, this is my personal end of one experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I look at it as um, if there was a dog or big cat walking behind you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't hear them. You don't hear their contact with the ground. And that's what I think the, the key difference is. And that's, what I, and that's what people don't tend to talk about when it comes to being barefoot. Is, you know, if you are kind of slamming into the ground, which many people do when they're wearing traditional shoes, um, if you do that barefoot, it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the feedback immediately. Yeah. So you start becoming much lighter on your feet. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if you're lighter on your feet, there's less pressure on your joints. So you're less likely to be degrading your joints. You're less likely to have, you know, early onset arthritis because you're not kind of crashing into the ground every single time you take a step. Yeah. So I find that I'm just much lighter and more nimble on my feet. Mm -hmm. And that transfers to when I'm running and also when I'm sprinting. Mm -hmm. So you become even lighter. And if you think about it, if you were sprinting, if you were, if you were tracking an animal, yeah. 
you'd have to be as quiet as, as possible. Right. You know, if you're in the Serengeti yeah. um, on a fairly hard, you know, very dry floor, it's, I mean, it's hard, it's mm. tough flooring. Um, you've got to be fairly light because if you're not, an animal's going to hear you. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that's what I find is probably the, the best benefit. You're much lighter on your feet and being more proprioceptive I, and awareness of where your body is in space, you're less likely to succumb to fixed movement patterns, which means you're more likely to uh, suffer from uneven surfaces, mm -hmm. you know? So, oh my gosh, I've twisted my ankle just out running or I've, I've fractured my foot going for a run. Why is that? It's because you're just so deconditioned. Right. And, and so um, it's so difficult for you to adapt. That's why your body um, is weak in that situation. Mm -hmm. So the more adaptive you can become, the more you can adapt to your environment um, and better able to pick up the sort of feedback that you need from the, from the ground the better you are going to be as a, in terms of movement, yeah. in terms of running. So yeah, Brilliant. barefoot movement um, is definitely one way to improve uh, your conditioning, you know, one's conditioning and, mm -hmm. uh, and adaptation to the environment, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I noticed, this is, uh, I don't want to interrupt mm -hmm. you, but I noticed my, my feet changed, my feet grew. So my ski boots actually no longer fit after I was doing a lot of barefoot hiking, from, mm -hmm. after, like from one season to the next. So same ski boots, same liner, same everything. It was tighter, my foot got wider. Have you heard about that? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you it, as I said, with these shoes, you have a wider toe box. So, mm -hmm. you know, your toes shouldn't be like so. You know, there should be some, a bit of a splay in your feet because you want to get as much feedback from the ground as possible. Mm -hmm. You want to be more balanced. You want to have uh, more nerve endings touching the ground, you know, increasing the surface area of your feet. Mm -hmm. So that should be the natural foot position. But for many of us, it's, it's like so, because we've been cocooning our feet in shoes for, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, so you will get some, what appears to be foot growth, but you're also gonna be getting some muscle growth. Could so be. less atrophy of the feet. Um, you know, you are gonna be getting some, you know, it's not gonna be, you're not gonna become like the Hulk. No, 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 you know, it was you, small amounts. It may not be a couple of shoe sizes, but you'll definitely have some growth. And that's one of the reasons why if you're buying minimalist shoes, you tend to buy a shoe size of one or two sizes uh, above the norm mm. so that your feet have room to move mm -hmm. so you don't want to feel constricted okay when wearing when wearing shoes really smart yeah all right you you had a train of thought you were going to go yeah, somewhere just, we're talking yeah. about the weather because it's it's un unseasonably cold here i know everyone thinks london is always cold but <laughs> um it's now unseasonably cold in mm -hmm. london and uh so we were, we're talking earlier about cold thermogenesis yeah um so i don't you know the serpentine lake is is in hyde park which people tend to go in for cold uh, a swim, a dip in the early morning. But what I tend to do is I just train all seasons, all year round. Um, so when it's snowing in London, when it's below freezing Celsius <laughs> in London, uh, I will still go out and train. And, um, you know, I wear appropriate garments for the weather, but as I get hollow, I'll, I'll start removing clothing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really good for the body to, again, part of adaptation. You know, if you're in a gym and you're constantly working or moving at like, a room temperature which is regulated at 17 degrees Celsius, whatever that is in, you know, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, say. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what the body should be um, always. There's no hormesis you know. there? There's no hormesis, yes, yeah. exactly. So, so temperature regulation is, is natural. Mm -hmm. Evolution has, has, adapt, you know, has made us aware of, okay, it's too hot, we sweat. Mm -hmm. It's very cold, we shiver. You know, we need to put more clothing on. We, we're getting these signals all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so regulating our core temperature actually burns more calories. So uh, you, can, you can get something like, if I train in the winter, there's like a 23% additional calorie burn. Wow. Um, and 13% more body, body fat is burnt. Um, you know, energy used as fuel from body fat when you're training in the cold. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as I, as I go when it comes to cold thermogenesis. So I, for me, I want, I want my practice to be as natural as possible. So rather than me trying to force kind of almost like an artificial, uh, create an artificial environment for me to, to say, okay, I want to get into a cold environment uh, by having a cold shower. Um, it's like, no, I can just go outside and mm. move um, and keep warm that way <laughs> yeah. through movement. Right. And so I'm not only fit in the summer. Cause I used to be one of those guys, like I tried to be fit just for the beach because mm -hmm. I want to have a six pack. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to look great in a t-shirt. Yeah. And then come the winter, I become a sloth but it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, put on lots of weight and like hibernate for the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, no, I need, I want to be capable and functional all year round. Yeah. So, um, so I tend to do both in the, when it's hot in the summer, I'm like, I'm going to train. Yeah. 
you know, I, I'm gonna, there'll be times when I won't be constantly hydrating myself. Yeah. I'll actually be like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really thirsty now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll rehydrate when the opportunity comes along. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot to being outdoors when it comes to movement. Uh, which is beneficial far and, and uh, you know, more so than just the physical activity itself. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. because the inclement con conditions, right? For yes. the body temperature. Additional wind resistance. If, mm. you, if you run on a treadmill versus running outdoors, and, you know, if you've ever been just an indoor runner and you take your first run outside, you feel like your lungs are on fire yeah. because you're just not used to, you know, the wind resistance, the air resistance. Mm -hmm. Even just looking in nature, there's, some, there's great research that the color green that you see in nature um, actually boosts the immune system. Hmm. Uh, it improves the, the immune system. Just looking at the color green, even looking at the photos wow. of natural landscapes uh, is, is, is helpful. And you're talking about yeah. Shinrin Roku research in Japan? Yeah, yes, or there's other ones just, too? There's other research, wow. yeah. 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 So, so, so um, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of interesting research. Uh, um, and, and one of the most fascinating was looking at fMRI scans. Oh. And, and look, you know, like, okay, it's, okay, you're in nature, that's, that's obvious that mm. you're going to feel more relaxed, less stress. Um, let's see if it works by looking at landscape pictures. So they literally just had people indoors looking at landscape pictures over a significant period of time, and they saw the same type of, uh, of, of kind of neurological and physiological uh, benefits. Wow, that's um, amazing. Yeah. So we, you know, yeah. if you think about it, this is our natural environment. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, so Why, it makes we, sense. Should, yeah. we should feel good. Uh huh being outdoors. Yeah, you know. it's like we're fish out of water, then we wonder why we're sick, right, as human beings. Exactly, and, yeah. And part of it, being in the UK, so we're talking about the cold thermogenesis, just to pick up upon what you're, we were talking about. So clearly, I've noticed, you know, we're, we're here to kind of film a, a low carb, short movie of sorts. Mm. And I noticed there's a lot of people eating a lot of high carbs. So if carbs was the sonic one on the only mechanism inducing people to gain weight and insulin, then we would expect a, a higher prevalence of obesity, which we haven't seen. And one thing we noticed, Sam and I, in our mm. Airbnb is the, the, the the showers are not built to like have super hot water. Like you're kind of taking very short, <laughs> coldish type showers, right? Yeah. And the heating systems in some of these homes in the UK are, are old, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think we're inducing brown adipose tissue through that. Whereas in the US, everything's big, modern, new, <laughs> Twenty minute showers, full bore <laughs> hot. You knock yourself out, American. So it's so funny all these things we're talking about, and then yeah. just being in nature. Um, yeah, I mean, and and to be fair, like, I mean, I'm my heritage is from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm African descent. So, you know, even on a cold day, in in the Serengeti is a pretty hot day. Do you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I think there is, you know, there are limitations, um, and you know, we do know there are, you know, I don't want to get hyperthermia. And I don't want to induce stress on myself, especially when we, we already live in a very highly stressed environment. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some kind of moderation as to the decisions you make in terms of what stresses I want to, to add artificially. So I do, I do believe that there is definitely some benefit. Um, there's lots of, again, lots of uh, evidence, anecdotal as well as research uh, of spending time in very cold environments. Uh, you know, Eastern Europeans have been doing that for years as part of their training regimens. As kids are, are bathing in freezing cold water, and, and, and they tend to have uh, you know healthier constitutions in, in doing so. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a place, but I think it's more important that every single day you expose yourself to a natural environment. You expose yourself to different uh, ranges of temperature, mm -hmm. and not just living a, in a you know uh, air conditioned, climate controlled environment all of the time. You know, so imagine if I'm training and I'm in an office at a certain temperature, then I go to a gym, you know, the same temperature, and I'm surrounded by four walls all of the time, and I'm surrounded, I'm in a car, or I'm on a tube, yeah, yeah. you know, and I can't see an horizon, I can't actually look into the distance, um, I can't appreciate the environment that I'm in, mm -hmm. you know. This is what's really important, actually looking at your environment and going, oh my goodness, that's, that is a tree, but it's different to the tree next to it, mm -hmm. and it's actually really interesting and really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and as a kid, we had that natural wonder. You know, anything you, anything you saw was fascinating. Oh no, there's another leaf on the floor. Wow, let me have a look. Yeah, look at this one, Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, um, and so that amazement and wonder is also helpful yeah. and also maintains kind of youthful exuberance once again. So mm -hmm. there's, there is so much to, 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 to being healthy than the food you eat and, and doing a bit of exercise. Totally. Um, you know, 
just being in touch with nature, recognizing that we are nature, mm -hmm. recognizing that human you know, contact and human communication is also important. Yeah. Um, and a, feeling a sense of purpose. So the gateway of the lifestyle that, you know, we, we live uh, was definitely food and movement for me. Mm -hmm. But now I recognize there's a, a much more holistic practice, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's reducing toxins, whether it's um, reducing toxic relation <laughs> relationships yeah. uh, and, you know, not just only having virtual communication, but actually having some real meaningful relationships and communication is also important mm -hmm. so um, there's a lot there's a lot to living a healthy lifestyle that again we don't want to be too boxed in and too dogmatic you know there are many pathways to better health and we want to embrace as many of those as possible to ensure we're minimi minimizing the risk of, yeah. of, of illness so many things come to mind about that, Gerald, but one of them is you were talking about the importance of being in nature and just seeing the trees move and the wind. So a lot of people have a hard time, you know, talking about things to improve is stress reduction and being yes. more mindful. I've noticed for people that when they meditate in their home or their office, or like the monkey mind's going, they can't stop thinking about the next email, the thing they have to do. Mm. But just by being in nature, hearing the trees move, the wind, touching yeah. the skin, yes. and walking barefoot is a great way to get into that calm meditative state. So if people are listening, Oh yes, that's a. I mean, that's a fantastic point, Mike. And and you know, this is again, this is this this is the a kind of a problem um, with with you know modernity, really, where you're you're trying to provide solutions to living in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So you go, okay, I need to meditate to get away from stress. So I'm going on this darkened room, playing this really meditative music, and I'm just going to chant for 30 minutes, and I'm going to feel great about myself. But if you think about it, when you were a child you would get into those meditative, blissful states, playing a game, playing with your imaginary friend, mm -hmm. you know, playing tig and tag, you know, tag or whatever, you know, that, that happens naturally. You have this compression of time, you know, where five minutes can seem like hours or five hours can seem like five minutes. So you don't need to slow things down to become more mindful. You just actually need to kind of open and be more aware of yourself and your environment. Mm -hmm. So there have been times when I've gone to my, my local park, which I call my gym, and I've played for hours and it's like, oh my goodness, I've, you know, what, what's the time? Oh my yeah. gosh, it seems like only 30 minutes have gone by. It's been, it's been hours mm -hmm. and you're not even aware of what's really happened. You've just yeah. been like, what Moving. did we actually do? Yeah. Just, moved, just moved around and had, and had fun. And that was very mindful and that was med very meditative and it was a great way to reduce stress. So mm -hmm. we know exercise, physical activity reduces stress. And we know that if you're outdoors, it enhances the, the effect of that stress reduction and stress management. Yeah. So just go, just go for a walk outside. Mm -hmm. Remove Reason. your headphones. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? Get off the phone. Yeah. Get off the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your, leave your phone at home. Go for a walk. Listen to the sounds around you. Even that person digging. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> We're noticing it. We're being <laughs> yeah. more mindful. We're being more mindful. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, yeah, these are these are all sounds that we should be paying. Mm -hmm. you know, paying some attention to. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, let's talk a little bit of, we were talking offline about carbohydrates and, and yeah. you know, you go to a lot of low carb conferences and speak at them and so forth. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what is your stance on low carb in general and then personalizing that for the individual? Yeah, so I, I mean, I believe low carb uh, is very therapeutic. Um, there's lots of evidence, both clinical evidence as well as anecdotal, that low carb can improve your health markers, your biomarkers, can definitely improve uh, insulin resistance, reverse type 2 diabetes. You know, it can help your body composition. I mean, the evidence is pretty irrefutable. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I do question whether, because something is therapeutic and helpful and can reverse conditions, that it also is the best way in terms of prevention. So um, I think if you have a healthy composition and a healthy me metabolism, I believe you can tolerate carbohydrates as long as if they're of the right type, mm -hmm. i.e. complex uh, carbohydrates not refined. Yeah. Um, I do believe you should avoid grains um, and just make better choices about any of the macronutrients you consume. Yeah. So as well as the evidence uh, of low carb being therapeutic and healthful, we also do see lots of populations around the world who have high proportions of carbohydrates in their diet, who don't suffer from modern lifestyle, chronic lifestyle disease, mm -hmm. as we do in the West. So if you have a condition that will benefit from reducing carbohydrate consumption, don't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> to get you, moving and doing all, yeah. to, to drop the carbs, but also look at the other components. Look eh? at the other components as well. So I yeah. was, was pre-diabetic, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd be a prime candidate for somebody to go low carb. So that's what I did. 
I improved the quality of fats, I reduced my refined carbohydrates, yeah. I reduced the amount of sugars that I was having, but I still ate fruit, not, too, not overeating, but I still ate some fruit. I increased the amount of vegetables I was eating, I removed grains, and uh, I improved the quality of protein. You know, I was having grass-fed meat rather than factory farm meat. Mm -hmm. And I reversed my pre-diabetes. Uh, pre um, you know, my A1C improved remarkably. I was no longer insulin, um, you know, had any in in issues with insulin sensitivity. Yeah. So by moving, um, which definitely helped, and by improving my diet, I was able to reverse those conditions as well as many others that I suffered from. So mm -hmm. I had a poor, horrendous lipid profile, yeah. uh, which alarmed pretty much anyone who looked at it. And it was like, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna drop dead mm -hmm. if you have a heart attack if you don't change. Um, but all of that improved remarkably. So, so I was a candidate for some reduction in carbohydrate intake, but the biggest change for me was the quality of those carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've been able to maintain my health status and my health markers have been, have been great for sort of 15 plus years Brilliant. now. Yeah. Um, but um, if I do have, you know, if I have somebody coming to me who's sedentary, who's morbidly obese, pretty much the first thing I would recommend is a significant reduction <laughs> um, to go to a, a low carbohydrate template for sure. Um, let's improve the quality of the fats you are consuming. Let's look at the proteins you're consuming. Let's start getting some physical activity in because, again, the evidence is irrefutable. Uh, especially resistance training, a great way to improve insulin sensitivity. Yeah. Um, and you, your window of, of insulin sensitivity is like 72 hours you know, post-activity. So, you know, arguably even better than maintaining, you know, even if you're fasting, you might fast for say 14, 18 hours mm -hmm. a day, two days at the most maybe, if you can really do well on fasting. I can just do a high intensity resistance training exercise for 30 minutes. For the next 72 hours, I'm gonna have a better insulin response, yeah. um, better, um, better blood glucose management just from that physical activity. Yeah. So once again, there are other things we can be talking about when mm -hmm. it comes to improving our lifestyle. Sleep, yeah. if I have poor quality sleep and I have you know, cortisol ramped up in the morning because I haven't had really good sleep, that affects my, my insulin, you know, I have a higher basal uh, insulin mm. rate just because of that. Mm. So it isn't just, it isn't just carbohydrate. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you, you mentioned that. And sleep, I, we noticed that through this jet lag that we are, our blood sugars are a little off. You know, it's kind of interesting. So it's, I think it's a good point for people to understand that there's other factors there. Yeah. Um, all right, so a few final questions here. If there was one herb, nutrient, or botanical you just couldn't live without, you can be stranded on the Caribbean, for example. <laughs> uh, vitamin D, omega threes are covered. What are you bringing with you? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, oh, so L, oh, you put me on the spot. Um, I would just hope that there was lots of coconut mm. on that island. So I'd, I'd basically, I'd have to learn. I'd get a manual on how to uh, climb a coconut tree. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. If there was one, only one movement you could do. One exercise. One multi-planar type movement. That's it. What would it be? Um, stand into a hunter-gatherer low squat into a bear crawl and repeat. Okay, Reverse we're, we're going to record that after. So you guys, if yeah. you're watching or listening to this, check out the YouTube video because we're, we're going to demonstrate that. Brilliant. Okay, your morning routine, your ideal morning routine. Like if you could do this every single day, what would it be and why? Well, I, I get out of bed differently every morning. So I don't drink coffee and I hate getting out of bed in the morning. So I have to I have to kind of really give myself a bit of a kickstart. So I, I'll jump out of bed, I'll burpee out of bed, I'll roll out of bed. Um, I'll do something different every single morning mm. to, to kind of excite me. And that's my morning ritual. And that's something that I want to continue, will continue to do. It's brilliant. Then I'll have a green tea. So ah. that's, <laughs> that's my kind of morning, morning yeah. coffee. So, okay, you're lying in bed, you're waking up, you're like, okay, yesterday I did this, now I'm gonna do something different. So what would that be, like rolling over or getting over on? It might, it might be rolling, it might be, you know, it might be kind of like, okay, you know, <laughs> it could be it, jumping on the bed. I mean, like literally any movement you can think of, uh -huh. I've probably done on the bed by myself, which is awesome. like pretty bizarre. Yeah. Talking about in public, but yeah. That's a really but, cool uh, thing for people to yeah, do. Yeah, it's, it's, if you do that, you do feel invigorated. Mm -hmm. And it's like having a, an espresso shot. Yeah, you get that like rush of like, okay, it's morning. Mm -hmm. It's it's a great day. Yeah, do something um, like rather than so like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna shuffle to the kitchen and yeah. put, put the coffee on, and I'm not gonna feel great until I have that coffee. And if you think about it, 
in the morning when your cortisol is should be elevated, should be at its highest, mm -hmm. you know, in the morning, you should feel great. Totally. You know, so yeah. you shouldn't feel lethargic. You should feel ready for the day. So that's what I do to kind of go, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm alive. Yeah. I feel great. Let's make the most of today. Right. So it's something I've been doing for, for a few years and uh, it definitely helps. Awesome. Helps that's get me out of bed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. I, I'm going to do that. I hope people listening will do that too. So yeah. final piece of advice, if you're in a lift or an elevator uh, with a parliament member, someone from the World Health Organization, they said, Gerald, you know, what sort of one lifestyle tip that you'd want me to just influence some policy around or mm. let other governmental bodies, you know, people, the politicians know uh, to implement? What would it be and why? I would stop the lift and say, let's take the stairs. Nice. Easy. <laughs> Easy enough. I'd say, yeah, let's actually have some warning signs telling people to take the stairs. Mm -hmm. Telling, warning people of the dangers of inact physical inactivity and be fairly alarmist about it. So I remember as a kid watching, seeing advertisements on the dangers of smoking and I very, as a very young kid. And my parents who smoked at the time, I was like, mom, dad, you know, this is what can happen to you if you smoke, if you continue to smoke that came from that almost a scare tactics of, uh, around smoking that convinced me not to smoke as an adult. Wow. And amazing. so I feel we need, we need the same type of messaging around living a sedentary lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, it is dangerous uh, um, and harmful to our health. And, um, and we haven't been as sedentary in human history as, as now. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we're the most sedentary we, we ever have been. So that's what I would, that's what I would target. That's what I'm most passionate about. Yeah, just movement. Yeah, and just it doesn't movement. have to be like going to the gym for 45 minutes. It can be your, not that non-exercise induced uh, um, thermogenesis, the NEAT. Yeah, the NEAT, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so just moving around, taking the stairs, like we sprinted up the escalator, we'll show that footage, you know, all that yeah. sort of thing. All that sort of weave stuff is, is, yeah, weave it in into your day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do some, more, do some manual housework. Yeah. So I, I use my vacuum less now, I, I actually get, I mean, dustpan and brush, mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> you know, and it's amazing the sort of positions you get into mm -hmm. if you're using a dustpan and brush to sweep your floor than using a, one of those automatic robots or, yeah. a, or a vacuum cleaner. Right. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, you've got to find some time and sometimes you've got to take the, the, the more, most difficult road yeah. um, and not seek out convenience. So if you avoid convenience, then you'll start recognizing that it's, it, you feel better in, in doing this. Oh, I'm using le less electricity. Yeah. By using my dustpan and brush. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually bending down. I'm getting to this really, I'm doing some mobility drills yeah. as I'm actually brushing, sweeping the floor, you know. Right. Thinking so I've just way. spent 10, 15 minutes doing that mobility drill rather than thinking I've got to change into my workout gear. Right. <laughs> you know, Drive I've got to the roll out mat, roll yeah. out the workout mat. It's like, no, no, I've actually got my movement minutes in just by doing some housework, yeah. playing with the kids, taking the stairs walking one or two bus stops mm -hmm. rather than taking the bus at the earliest opportunity. Yeah. So you don't have to carve out 30, 40 minutes a day as a hobby. You can just try to integrate movement in your day as much as possible and beyond, without any doubt, make sure it's fun. Uh -huh. Because if it isn't, it's going to be a short-term lifestyle change and you'll forget about it until next New Year's Eve. Yeah. <laughs> Daryl Edwards, thanks so much for coming on the show. This is really awesome.